that crazy guy who lived there? He was kind of like, I mean, Chris honestly, Porter. yes. What was his last name? Porter. Chris Porter. Christopher Porter. Chris Porter reminds me of one of those people who run those, uh, those lion petting yeah. zoos, like in that recent documentary that just came out on Netflix. It's like called yeah. Tiger Tiger King. Tiger King. He reminds me just like one of those people, like where he just has that giant swimming pool with all those dolphins in there, and he goes in there and swims with them, and that literally blew my you mind. See correlation with all those people, like you know, there's a bunch of them. There's you know, there's all these. There's a guy on uh, Instagram, the real Tarzan. Someone showed me his account the other day, and the guy's a clown. It's like it's never about the dolphins uh, or the animals. It's about them. The animal is the backdrop, and it's always about getting the picture, the Instagram picture, as close as you can with a chimpanzee, with a lion, with whatever it is. It's like any true sanctuary does not let you take selfies with the animal. We don't like our place where we have the dolphins. The general public is not allowed in there. There's no one coming. You can't take selfies. No one's coming and swimming with the dolphins. The dolphins are retired. Like they're just there to be wild animals, and that's what wild animals do. Mm -hmm. Um. I never, you know, there's a huge fascination with the Irwin family. And, the, you know, for me, he was one of the worst things that ever happened to wild animals, Steve Irwin. You know, really? he owns a zoo and he's just trying to promote animals in captivity. And, you know, before him, when I grew up, all the documentaries, you know, when you saw a great documentary about lions, it was usually by a husband and wife team that lived in Africa for four years with the lions and had the absolute longest lens you could ever have and got you right in there with lions yeah. being lions. Steve Irwin was all about how close can I get to the animal? And it, it was all about a wide angle lens, not a zoom lens. Like how freaking, you know, how up close on top can I jump out of the truck and land right on the animal? And it changed, the, it became a spinoff of shows all about that. And it just changed the relationship. It, it, was, it used to be all about being as far away and letting the animal be an animal and seeing the behaviors that, because as soon as you introduce a person, the animal's not doing wild animal behaviors anymore he's doing something else and so it, it yeah. changed our whole relationship with animals not for the better i think yeah there's sort of this weird primal desire that humans have to be next to them or to hold them or to like harness the power of this wild animal so you see online a lot of these uh, social media so-called sanctuaries and it's the person who runs the sanctuary it's like they're in every picture it's like right that's not what i want to see i want to see the animals just being animals not you like not about you. Yeah, it's so it's so weird. So the guy Chris Porter, where where does he live? He's Canadian. He was he's from Canada. Can he's from Canada, but doesn't he live in like Indonesia somewhere? He was in the Solomon Islands, but that's all after that show it all shut down. You see at oh, the end, that he, the dolphins let go and he he was he was at, when I was there he was out of money like Really? I was having to give him a little bit of like 20 bucks every day just so to buy some food for him and the guys like he had no money. Like he had bought his ticket to, to be on that episode to get there and showed up with like zero dollars. Like, because that was fascinating, man. That, that was that thing, the way that you guys had to travel to get there, to interview the people that were living there that lived off these dolphins. I go there all the time. I usually go there twice a year. Solomon Islands. That's next to Papua New Guinea. Why do you go there twice a year? What do you do when you go there? Well, a couple of things. Um, the reason he go, went there is because Solomon Islands is probably one of the only places in the world where they traditionally hunt dolphins. They've been doing it maybe because it's an or only an oral history there, but it could go back 500 years, 600 years that they've been hunting dolphins. And in Solomon's, they've kind of mixed like dolphin hunting and like Christianity and like Judaism into almost one thing where like, you know, some people equate when they're sliding the dolphins that it's the blood of Christ. And then they're in the Solomons, it's very tribal. And so they do a dowry when they get married and this, the villages that do the dolphin hunting, dolphin teeth is a very important part of the dowry. When you get married, every wedding, the bride and her whole family are dressed in head to toe wearing dolphin, you know, headbands and ne big ornate necklaces. And they string dolphin teeth together to form like strings of like almost like money. And so it's very symbolic for them. Um, and so what the dolphin dealers and dolphin hunters, people that sell dolphins to aquariums realized countries that will allow people to slaughter dolphins 
will probably allow us to catch a few of them and export them. So people like Chris Porter realized, oh, they're slaughtering dolphins in the Solomons. I bet we could probably export. If they're catching them already, we could just pay them a little extra to catch them for us, and we could export them out of the country to aquariums. And so that's what he did. And so he created a mess where tribes there were going and just catching dolphins. And, you know, Chris Porter wouldn't be around. He'd be in Canada. And they'd just catch the dolphins and have 30 dolphins penned together and they tried to keep them alive until Chris Porter showed up. They didn't know if he was coming in a week or a month. And these are villages that are barely, they're catching one fish to feed themselves for that day. They're and living now, in huts. And now they're having to feed 30 dolphins for some guy that might give them money. And so it just created disaster scenarios where, you know, dolphins were being caught and dying in these pens and the villages were getting upset and warring with each other over money, some white guy and like, so I've been continuing. I um, mean, if you see blood dolphins, there's a tribe called Fanale. They're the specific tribe that really hunt dolphins to this day. And I've been slowly working with them to see if they will move away from dolphin hunting. And so I built them like schools and I've been providing the kids educations and um, different kinds of grants to the villages as the numbers of dolphins decrease that are killed. And um, Now, do you go there with like a team of people or... No, I go by myself or I go sometimes with, um, there's an anthropologist that I work with. She lives in Miami and she did her doctoral thesis on that village back in the 70s. And so I go with her a lot just because she knows the village. They, she's been going there so long and um, I can okay. speak their local language now, but I couldn't when I first went there. So it was helpful.